Chapter Thirteen of the Ins and Outs of Paris or Paris by Day and Night by Julie de Marguerite. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Small Trades of Paris. There are many ways of making money in Paris, which are not dreamt of in the economy of other cities, and some of these trades ought no longer to exist in the present age of civilization. To make a confession, humiliating as well to Paris as to a Parisian this our well-beloved capital of the artistic world whose refinement of manner wit eloquence taste literature and the arts are far in advance of every other country is in material civilization one nay two centuries behind other capitals especially new york and philadelphia whose dwelling-houses are more convenient and comfortable than those of any other country in the world these minor professions and trades of paris go on from generation to generation and though there is not one of them in which a fortune ever was or can be made yet they are all industries which supply a living to those engaged in them with an occasional billet de spectacle without which no frenchman is truly happy the truth is that without wishing to take away any othello's occupation we must say we think the evils or primitive nuisances which have made these occupations a necessity should be done away with for instance it is a stubborn fact that at this very moment all the water consumed in every house in paris is carried every day by pail into the kitchen by a man whose stock in trade is the water he gets from the various fountains in the city constructed for that purpose first it is brought in a large barrel placed on wheels which the owner harnessed like a beast of burden drags about to his customers to whom it is distributed at two sous the pail the sum which this very necessary commodity thus costs a small family is from five to six francs a month just imagine the many inconveniences of this river god in velveteen jacket and wooden shoes bringing the daily supply of water to all the various tenements of a parisian house your pail travels to the porter's lodge where the tribute for the right of way is a gratuitous supply of water to the portiere then up the six or seven stories to the mansard of the grisette whose two pails a week supply her limited wants at the very door la porte cochere begins a premonitory puddle and on every step of your staircase there is a capacious arabesque in aqua pura or if the man is careful and not in love with the cook of the apartment to which he is going merely a slight dab expanding until it is lost or absorbed by your own polished boots or the trailing petticoats of some lady now the conquerors legislators revolutionists socialists kings emperors and all other possessors of paris have never suggested any other mode than this most primitive one of supplying the city with water they accumulated the fountains in the streets and on the boulevards but the idea of a general reservoir and pipes communicating with the houses seems never to have occurred to them so round these fountains so beautiful in their architecture you will see a conglomeration of wooden casks on wheels wooden pails and wooden shoes you will hear such a rendering of the french language as you had never heard before first for its dialect and next for the exceedingly rich and picturesque oats with which it is seasoned as the savoyards have a peculiar vocation for chimney sweeping so have the auvergnats the monopoly of water carrying they are a strong athletic race bringing from the rugged mountains of their picturesque country the honesty and simplicity supposed to distinguish the swiss but which has been educated out of them by numerous tourists sober of course for intemperance is an exception in france handsome and good-natured your porteur d'eau in his deep blue velveteen jacket with many white buttons his turned-down collar and broad-brimmed hat is the passion of some sentimental cook who watches for his daily visit with a beating heart offers him a chair calls him not like others by his professional appellation but monsieur antoine or monsieur andre and presents him with a cup of the fluid in which he deals infused with a portion of her master's mocha the auvergnat is no gay deceiver nor is he easily caught he has an eye to the main chance and chalks up his profits on the end of his cask and therefore knows how many more such sums it would take to maintain two instead of one he would not marry for money feed donc not for money alone but a comfortable little capital at the savings bank will settle the question between two rivals for his affections 
and make him at once decide whose of the many eyes that look favourably on him are the brightest it takes about fifty francs to set up a porteur d'eau and the only ambition open to this class is to possess several water casks and farm them out the porteur d'eau is a great politician particularly in the part of the city near the temple and the faubourg st antoine about four o'clock each day his work being ended the chateau d'eau with its classic lions ever pouring forth the sparkling water becomes a sort of debating society seated on the shaft of his cart he may be seen surrounded by some scores of his fellows diligently reading and commenting upon the contents of a crumpled and somewhat torn newspaper the porteur d'eau varies his political readings sometimes he is calm just a milieu sometimes violently red sometimes he belongs to that wholesome opposition necessary to sustain the ministers sometimes he stoutly upholds all people in power and the authorities generally or at others eschewing graver studies he gets deep into the details of the fashion or the discussions of the dilettanti of which he understands very little excepting when metaphorical musical critics compare certain voices to limpid streams torrents avalanches and sparkling waters then between the memory of his mountain streams and his water casks he gets at the true meaning his tastes and his politics of course depend upon the paper which his dulcinea like her of tobosa much addicted to the peeling of vegetables and not at all literary contrives to steal from her master to her a newspaper is a newspaper one is as good as another she regards them all as a sort of luxury indulged in by men much the same as those small vices to which tobacco is the ministering angel and knows no more about the merits of one paper above another than she does of the various qualities of the weed your porteur d'eau too is also a hero of paul de coq one of the fruitful author's novels bearing the title and treating of these distinguished personages paul de coq chooses his heroes most judiciously among his readers next to this hero of the kitchen comes the hero of the ante-room the frotteur now your frotteur is a much smarter man than your porteur d'eau he is almost always a parisian full of the true parisian wit and vivacity honest and merry he has read some stray volume from all the libraries he goes into in his daily avocation and usually prefers voltaire he likes the way in which that witty philosopher has treated all obscure and metaphysical subjects and appreciates more his dictionnaire philosophique than he does the dreamy serious and melancholy essays of all the modern philosophers and reformers he is a man of the world too and listens eagerly to all he hears and he hears much and often strange things for people think no more of him than they do of the furniture he rubs he is sans conséquence the femme de chambre who looks down on the porteur d'eau simpers and smiles at the frotteur and will go on a sunday to the ambigu or the vaudeville with this most gallant of cavaliers whose running conversation between the acts makes her laugh as much for he speaks loud that all may have the benefit of his good things as arnal le peintre jeune or ravel on the stage the frotteur is an exclusively french production he is like his avocation untranslatable we can only give you a catalogue raisonné of his duties in order that you may get an idea of him to every family he comes once a week he arrives with a green baize bundle under one arm and an enormous feather broom under the other no sooner has he entered than he doffs off his coat he wears a coat puts on a linen jacket gets out of his shoes appearing in very clean blue worsted stockings and retaining his jaunty cap on one side of his curly head dives into the various rooms of the apartment asterisk the reader of course understands that the word apartment in its french signification means the several rooms composing a household in a tenement house then after a preliminary sweeping of floors shaking of curtains the moving of every article of furniture to free it from dust he ends by strapping to his foot a hard brush well waxed which with a supply of wax he has taken from his green baize now transformed into an apron thus equipped his arms akimbo whistling or singing some popular air he begins skating over the rooms in all directions carpets have it is true made sad inroads on the duties of the frotteur 
almost every salon has its d'aubusson carpet in the middle of the floor and la chambre de madame is carpeted all over with the looms of salon Rouge. but the dining-room the library the ante-room in fact every other portion of the apartment has not been invaded by the anglicismatic carpet so that all these floors composed either of oak or of brick have to be rubbed and brushed until they are polished as the brightest mahogany table then how the frotteur glories in his work and how puzzling it is to feet unused to the slide and guide of a parisian walk to get safely over the floor without being suddenly precipitated upon it it is decidedly pleasanter to look at than to sit on the frotteur's is hard work though it has a certain dignity which compensates for much he is well paid and his ambition is boundless but he generally attains nothing beyond marrying a femme de chambre who so considerately administers to him a verre de vin with some stray piece of pâté in the ante-room then they settle down as the concierge in the fourth-rate hotel garni where she by furnishing breakfast and attending generally to the lodgers makes a nice little profit whilst he with one or two sprawling frotteur apprentices keeps the whole house in order executing confidential communications giving obliging information and in every way helping out strangers in their parisian experiences for which he gets well remunerated at the corner of every street you will observe there stands with the pertinacity of a policeman an honest good-natured looking man with a quick eye which seems to have the power of glancing all ways at once he is a commissionaire the most intelligent discreet and trustworthy messenger that ever carried billet doux challenges or billet de banque in summer he sits on a little truck peculiar to his trade and plays with very greasy cards eternal games of écarté with the lemonade merchant on the corner the mechanical cry of limonade glacée by the latter in no wise interrupting the scientific combinations of the game in winter the commissionaire stands by the warm fragrant furnace of the marchand de marron a trade frequently to be seen in new york and philadelphia or just shelters himself from the snow and rain within the sill of the marchand de vin here or perhaps within some hospitable porte cochere on a rainy day the commissaire establishes a profitable and heaven knows how necessary in the streets of paris an industry producing brushes of every size and limpid blacking he cleanses your boots from all traces of the mud of the dirtiest streets you ever imagined or ever saw excepting pardonnez those of your own new york immaculate boots being indispensable in paris to all his humble establishment makes wonderful profits and the last few years have produced many imitators on a grand scale in all the frequented localities such as the place de la bourse the passage choiseux the passage de l'opera etc these are large shops hung with mirrors and having high velvet benches on which the customer sits reposing his feet on a lower one and reading the journal always on hand here whilst the decrotteur performs his office two sous pays for this luxury no dearer than at our friends the commissionaire yet immense sums have been realized by this trade of such universal utility many people have their boots cleaned before entering every house they visit and a clerk bringing a parcel from a linen draper's is as particular as a suitor bouquet in hand going to visit his intended strange is it not that with this love of neatness and luxury the french should be so slovenly in all the details of their houses and streets it has given them the reputation of a dirty people whereas personally perhaps they are the cleanest in europe End of chapter 13。Chapter 14 of the Ins and Outs of Paris, or Paris by Day and Night, by Julie de Marguerite. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Jeunesse Dorée, the Garde Nationale. The name of Jeunesse Dorée was first given to the class it indicates in the time of the First Empire. And though we use it metaphorically, it originated in the literal fact that napoleon i with the tastes of his italian origin though he never indulged them in his own person covered the military and court uniforms with gold and silver embroidery subsequently the jeunesse dorée were supposed to mean a class of young men devoted to vanity dissipation and pleasure at least this was the acceptation of the name to all the plodding money-making community 
but this was exactly the reverse of the truth for in france riches name a great tailor and unexceptionable equipages will not give a passport to high society or include an aspirant in the exclusive circle of the jeunesse dorée such worthies are only the jeunesse dorée for the crowd they themselves are perfectly aware of their own insignificance in the estimation of the circle to which they aspire in vain under the first napoleon the great and indispensable desideratum was to be a military man not a fine militia captain or colonel or general which you are so fond of being on the other side of the atlantic not a slim sighing stripling tied to a clanging sabre like the life guardsmen of england they may have improved though some of them certainly have not under the discipline of the crimea but a warrior whose rank gave him only the privilege over the common soldier of being first to face the enemy deeds of valour were then thought the only ones worthy of a man and women would scarcely listen to the vows of a civilian however distinguished he might chance to be then all this passed away the napoleon of peace as his flatterers styled him the napoleon of pence louis philippe as he was with more appropriateness called by impartial contemporaries introduced an era of circumspection of reason and sharp bargains the head and not the arm manifested strength the parisians went into the other extreme and ridiculed the eternal love of uniforms and gewgaws the enrolling of all the fat civilians in the national guard entirely destroyed for a time the military prestige in france and it was not until the excitement and enthusiasm of the present war encouraged by the language and actions of another napoleon that the innate love of fighting existing in the breast of every frenchman broke out again into full activity some years since the jeunesse dorée formed themselves into an association which from the anglomania which even then began to prevail a forerunner of the present strict and cordial alliance between the two nations was called the jockey club this club includes many gradations of rank but all are distinguished for some talent most of the politicians whose eloquence resounded during the two years of anarchy and intoxication which reigned in france dalton she de montalembert etc etc were members of this club so was the duke of orleans and his artistic taste much affected the general tone of young men in the reign of louis philippe journalists authors artists some of them uniting both birth and fortune are members of this club the very slight distinction which still existed between the artist and the man of letters was entirely obliterated under louis philippe the familiarity of the duke of orleans with his friends and associates was proverbial eugene su was his intimate companion as well as dumas and other distinguished littérateurs among the rest alphonse carr until a most romantic and scandalous love affair of cars a man of no principle in affairs of gallantry excluded him from the moral court presided over by the queen marie amelie in the wing of the tuileries allotted to the duke of orleans and his exemplary wife all the taste of the parisian artists were consulted in the arrangement and embellishment of a suite of apartments which when finished presented the rare aspect of a royal salon without ennui or etiquette liszt and chopin would sit down at the piano unasked and improvise while the inspired fit was on them those who loved to hear them would gather round whilst others would saunter about the adjoining rooms discussing poetry with larmatine and the beautiful duchess de nemours while the mathematical duke her husband talked politics and statistics with guizot perignon seguier and other celebrities of the bar and cabinet gautier su dumas and Janet would carry on a war of wit with many of the sparkling bells of this novel court whilst the duke of orleans himself would promenade through the picture gallery with biard gudin scheffer or winterhalter conversing with them on his favourite subject of the beauties of art and the high mission of artists there were few women of celebrity excepting for beauty accomplishments or elegance the princess elena here gave the tone and unfortunately women of talent in all countries contrive to put themselves into exceptional positions which exclude them from society or choosing their own friends eschew and avoid all general assemblies where even in the most refined class both men and women are ready to attack calumniate and prejudge the words motives and actions of a being who infringes on the privileges of both sexes such a woman invariably excites general envy and ill-nature 
as well as the most violent admiration and most extravagant attachments two things which women doom to dwell in decencies for ever never forgive and which men for the sake of their own family ties are called on to resent and censure biard was the most intimate chum of the duke of orleans and his wife lovely well-educated elegant without any preponderance of genius or esprit sufficient to make her enemies was one of the exceptions to the general rank of the female guests she has since acquired an ephemeral and disgraceful celebrity madame paul de la roche the beautiful daughter of vernet was another bright particular star in this serene horizon but she has faded into an early grave one day the duke of orleans who was in the habit of visiting his friend in his studio inquired at the porter's lodge before going up whether m billard was at home i don't know replied a voice which the duke did not recognize for the concierge and his wife having gone on a holiday had confided the loge to a friend but you can go and see and at the same time as you are going up you can take these things the tailor has just left for him the duke obeyed mounted the six stories for the sake of the light a studio is always at the top of the house and not finding the artist deposited his bundle with a message for his friend with the stupefied servant who of course knew him and could in no wise see the connection between his master's new clothes and the prince royal meantime the duke descended the stairs and putting his head into the little aperture in the door of the porter's lodge always open for the accommodation of visitors said mon ami i have left the coat and trousers in safe keeping tell monsieur billard i hope they will fit merci monsieur who shall i say called will monsieur give me his name my name is not a difficult one but in case you should forget it there is something to help your memory and giving him a louis d'or he added tell monsieur billard it was his friend the prince royal in such a state of things it was natural that the jeunesse d'arrêt should assume a tone of dignified simplicity and intellectual superiority the real fast men as you call them shangay is the slang word i believe in the land of barnum are neither horse jockeys nor blacklegs nor heroes of scottishes and polkas though they profess a great taste for the turf have many english members in their club ride steeplechases at the croix de berny dance and are gallant and attentive to women in society but to compromise any woman by manifesting their admiration or monopolizing her society before the world would lead to ostracism from their own circles they certainly patronize danseurs of not immaculate virtue and often have a snug establishment in the quartier de la lorette but such liaisons are strictly private and not one of these young men would take his dulcinea in his own carriage to his own box at the opera or give her his arm in public if this were done neither mother nor sister would ever trust to his escort again the quietest possible dress the simplest and most unobtrusive equipages etc are tokens of the jeunesse d'ari moderation in their expenses so as to bring them within their income respect for age and family ties and a thorough absence of affectation characterize the members of le jockey club the creme de la creme of paris it is true that since the commencement of the russian war the military spirit has assumed its ancient power over the enthusiastic and patriotic young men of france who are as eager now as were those of former generations to win renown in arms and glory to the flag of france still all ostentation of mere material display all boasting all affectation all pretension of dress style or equipage is considered snobbish and vulgar but there is a class however a class of young men as handsome often richer clever brave and bright who are of a different quality and who do duty before the general public as the genuine jeunesse d'ari this gilded troop may be seen passing in most eccentric carriages with the fastest horses scampering through the streets those brilliant waistcoats worn by the simpering gentlemen in the fashion place are invented for them they glory in the love of the most dévergondé dancers of the opera the lionne a woman who talks slang smokes cigars drinks a bottle of champagne at breakfast and wears the beflounced becorded velveted peignoir also seen in the fashion plates and at newport and saratoga in your country money these young men have and debts too which latter they think essential to their position as fast men pastes pomades 
oils cosmetics patent razors gold inlaid dressing cases brocade morning gowns betasseled green smoking caps and morocco babouches are especially invented for them and are by them enjoyed they think it fun to cheat at play to founder a horse to seduce an ouvrière to enrich a courtesan to fight with a gendarme and before being an officer in the national guard might imply hot gunpowder and cold lead that was considered as being almost a hero now however the cue of this class is to affect to despise everything and more especially the garde nationale they loved in reality only the importance the uniform and the display of mock soldiering it was considered a year or two ago a high achievement for them to be called before a court-martial how little marshal mars himself only could know where pacific grocers retired butchers and guileless linen drapers sat in solemn judgment then to be condemned to an unheard-of number of hours imprisonment for such misdemeanours as dodging one's turn to mount guard or misleading the patrol or making a sergeant drunk was the climax of fun as also to go to the prison called the hotel des haricots from haricots or beans forming the principal prison food and there ordering the most helio gabelline supper from chavet seducing the authorities into putting so much of the enemy into their brains as to considerably fuddle them and make each learned dogberry write himself down an ass fun it was deemed also to go to this prison and after making a great fuss getting a room and arranging to the inconvenience of the whole establishment to stay the full time of your condemnation to then signify your intention of remaining but a quarter of an hour the radamantine tribunal aforesaid allowing you to pay your imprisonment by instalments at any period or for any length of time it might suit them but now all this is over grim war has laid aside his masking mood and donned the armour of the battlefield a band as steady and a will as stern as his whose career the first jeunesse d'arie attended through all its glories guides the military ardour of the nation and points to achievements as glorious as those he has immortalized our sham heroes have suddenly forgotten their patriotism and it is now by our heroes of the flashy waistcoats and incredible cravats universally voted that the garde nationale is a vulgar institution but what they still consider as special fun beware o oh young america for to you i have been speaking from the first it is a special fun to get hold of a foreigner bent on becoming the fashion they will not hesitate to take him into the most equivocal society to introduce him to some fair and frail creature and induce him to take her to the bois de boulogne the opera and the cafés thereby for ever shutting against him the doors of those really noble intellectual and elegant salons so ready to receive and welcome strangers it is fun to teach their victim to waste his money to buy their spavent horses to dress ridiculously to learn slang french and then to let him go home ruined in health and robbed in pocket swearing that there is not a good horse or a virtuous woman in paris that all the men are chevaliers d'industrie and that the absurd and laughable figure you cut in your crimson waistcoat flaring cravat little watch chain to a buttonhole by a gold cable and a bunch of gridirons horseshoes hearts and opera glasses by way of charms and your little legs stuck into landscape trousers with a view of fontainebleau on one leg and the drachenfels on the other is the height of the paris fashion beware o oh innocent stranger again we say beware these people may be found with remarkably curled and perfumed heads walking five or six abreast down the alleys of the tuileries talking loudly and flourishing impossible canes at the cafe anglais or the maison dorée they will order everything out of season and at the opera they will lean out of the box clap louder than the orchestra with their yellow kid gloves take you with a flourish behind the scenes and to show their superiority utter an impertinence to or take a liberty with every dancer who comes in their way finally they invite you to supper with an actrice du boulevard or a circus rider of franconi's and whispering in her ear that you are un brave américain un peu jeune a little green set you down to lanquenet or bouillotte while your hostess wrapped in lace and muslins buried in her armchair and cigar in mouth surveys you with a knowing air winks at one of her own friends shrugs her shoulders at your introducers and laughs in your face 
this may be called the jeunesse crivée copper which to the ignorant looks like gold as the elkington plate resembles silver but those who become friends of the family or wish to buy must know the difference so would you not be made a fool of when you go to paris be sure of taking some means to enable you to distinguish between the true and the false jeunesse d'ari end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the bourgeoisie louis philippe in addition to his other names was also called le roi de la bourgeoisie so he may have been but then when the bourgeoisie came into power it grew ambitious like all other parvenus aspired to distinctions and to rank and emerged into what it deemed a higher sphere certain it is that during the reign of the citizen king the bourgeoisie almost entirely disappeared if it elected the monarch by its own individual power it was not to prove that after all the bourgeois or burghers were the most sensible the most patriotic the most enlightened class of his majesty's subjects but merely that they might be enabled to spring from the mediocrity and inglorious usefulness of a middle class into ministers deputies courtiers consuls and ambassadors expanding their ample chest to the many ribbons honours and crosses which they had all their lives sneered at and secretly envied of the privileged class they banished i can find you some bourgeois still however bourgeois who glory in the title as the citizens of the middle ages who so successfully opposed the kingly powers bourgeois who would rather be what they are merchants or tradesmen succeeding each other through long generations than nobles dating their nobility from yesterday your bourgeois is rich yet there are certain luxuries which he would as soon think of buying as of wearing a crown instead of a hat because he could afford to pay for it he keeps a carriage but it will have only one horse a good strong serviceable fellow who gallops off with the whole family as if they were additional wings instead of additional weights for the fine sleek rogue has been eating his corn in the stable all the week whilst his master has been working your bourgeois never dreams of taking out his carriage during the week he takes a cabriolet whilst his wife and daughter modestly ensconce themselves in a citadine if by chance they have a distant visit to pay though a bourgeoise does not often leave her home except on sunday in this class it is a matter of pride that all the members of the family should work the sons the mother and the fair young elegant and accomplished daughters who will combine all these charms with a thorough knowledge of business and a perfect contentment with the routine of horrid word a trade will you come with me across the pont royal then all along the quai voltaire pausing perhaps at every ten steps before bookstalls with rare old books and engravings such as patient fingers made them before the various lithographs and photographs and heaven knows how many other graphs came to thrust such toiling plodding aside looking up for a moment at the hotel de la villette where voltaire died closed now for more than eighty years left in solemn darkness and solitude out of respect to his memory whilst the revolution his pen had raised has stormed and raged itself to silence without till we come in sight of the bronze henry the fourth on the pont neuf this is the quai conti here is a high house regular and symmetrical with traces of the mansard architecture dating in about louis the fourteenth's time a large porte cochere gives it the appearance of a mansion but above it a painted board declares that au premier messieurs blank et fils silversmiths and jewellers have their magasins ascend the broad stone stairs push those large glass doors and here we are a large room with elegantly gilded walls and soft carpets mirrors comfortable chairs etc a drawing-room in fact except that the large cases around contain most magnificent specimens of a favrie rivalling benvenuto and his followers and that one end of the long rosewood counter contains every article of jewellery from the cheapest and most important the wedding ring to the dearest and most useless the diamond de riviere as we enter a young lady with her neat dress made in the latest though not the most extravagant fashion and her silken hair 
french women have beautiful hair artistically yet simply arranged advances with a courtesy and a grace which custom only associates with courtly manners and asks you what it is the object you desire she leads you to the counter shows you what you want will enter into your views advise with you as to what is most serviceable what most becoming then if the purchase is important the quiet ladylike mother will rise from her seat put down her embroidery and fastening the earrings in her daughter's ears or the diamond sprays in her hair will give you the practical illustrations of the becomingness of parisian art all the families of the faubourg st germain bring their family jewels to this magasin here for centuries are inscribed on the books of the house generation after generation of the same names by various hands of the contemporary generation of this family of jewellers during the revolution of seventeen ninety three many were the family jewels hidden and preserved by these high specimens of honesty and honour the original possessors of these jewels were no more they had died on the scaffold but their children have received from the children of the jeweller all of them back safe and intact to the smallest stone sometimes the grandmother with her white hair her open silk dress with the flounced stiff petticoat beneath and the fichu which marie antoinette crossed over her bosom will come from the inner room leaning on the arm of a young and blooming granddaughter she comes to greet some aged customer as old as herself whom she has known as one of the beauties of marie antoinette's court but who is now a grave and sorrow-stricken woman who has left husband and children in foreign graves and to whom privation and suffering have grown familiar the aged bourgeoise so happy that her obscurity and insignificance preserved her from the revolutionary storm will talk with saddened tone to the good duchess of years gone by of the brilliant and courteous seigneurs of former days so gay so liberal so polite how all are now dispersed some on the plains of la vendee some on the shores of germany some in unknown graves in england and many in the fausse commune of the guillotine at clamart the son of this model bourgeois is a fine intelligent young man who brings an artist's tastes into his trade he has travelled and has studied the setting of stones in all the shrines of the saints in italy and spain he is an accomplished draughtsman and passes his time in the workshop and in furnishing elegant artistic designs family love is the great religion of this class in france where in all ranks respect for family ties is universal a desire to extend their business in their own sphere is their only ambition whilst the greatest of all their enjoyments is the possession of a country house near paris where on a sunday the whole family from the aged grandmother to the very youngest grandchild may assemble at the same table it is for this that the sleek horse above mentioned is solely reserved railroads and steam cars may puff and dash past the very door you will not get your staid bourgeois to give up his jog-trot of two leagues an hour and if victor or oscar the young men of the family will be so reckless as to trust themselves to these new inventions mammas sisters and wives will offer many secret halves for their preservation till they see them safe and sound at the garden gate the country house so called is at auteuil verrieres sceaux or clamart all lovely environs of paris within a two hours drive auteuil since the fortifications and the almost incorporation of the bois de boulogne into paris has been very much deserted by the bourgeois artists actors and authors have bought those lovely cottages and luxuriant gardens for in the capital of the arts artists authors and actors elsewhere proverbially poor are rich and prosperous scribe has a beautiful house here also beranger anisette bourgeois de la croix mademoiselle annet mademoiselle dose dumas or had and many other celebrities every sunday brings to these people guests of their own set making as you may imagine very merry and delightful parties as you pass by the sound of billiard balls music and laughter makes your heart glad for sympathy now there is nothing your bourgeois so much dreads as an artist they scarcely believe in his talent for they cannot understand the utility of his labours then they set him down as an extravagant unprincipled irreligious the bourgeois would rather see his daughter marry to the poorest workman in his atelier than to an artist and to know that the son had spoken to an actress would be a source of actual grief to his mother so 
our bourgeois has left auteuil and behold him ensconced in a square stone house at verrieres it has in front a large paved courtyard and behind a garden with its vines overhanging alleys its currant bushes its strawberry beds its peach cherry almond apricot and pear trees teeming with fruit here is an alley for nine pins there opening on to the lawn a billiard-room close by shaded by an overhanging willow fashioned into a bower sit the matrons of the family then a little further off are the younger matrons showing off to sisters-in-law the toddling progress of the babies since last sunday further on their arms twined round each other's waists slowly pacing up and down a shaded alley are the young girls whispering low those girlish secrets which the week may have furnished or consulting about some surprise to be got up out of their slender purse for the fate or birthday of some member of the family at twelve the breakfast with its cold dishes of meat and fish its hot and deliciously seasoned vegetables with fruit of every kind its bordeaux its sweet vin blanc ending with a cup of such coffee as only a parisian servant can make then at six the dinner such as is not to be had out of france but by those rich enough to pay a sawyer or a yule of their own a sum equal to a revenue here at the right hand of her son the master of the house let whoever will be the guest sits the venerable grandmother and then around are dispersed the family even to the child propped up in its high chair well brought up and accustomed to be with their parents it must be said that french children are well behaved having discretion to cry only in proper season in this rank of life young girls never go to school but under the eye of their mother acquire by the help of masters the instruction and accomplishments suited to their station a part of the company not to be forgotten are the servants so attentive and respectful they have probably been for twenty years in the family and love it as their own between breakfast and dinner a long strolling walk in the woods of verrieres is taken by those who love the country really though it must be confessed that the true bourgeois does not include long walks woods or fine scenery among his enjoyments the trees of his garden and his own flower-beds satisfy his aspirations for the picturesque and his pedestrian tastes are sufficed by walking round his own billiard-table inhaling the country perfumes through his open windows admiring the prattle of his grandchildren and the song of canary-birds as it is borne to him on the gentle breeze that shakes the blossoms from the trees but the absence of city noises the assembly of the whole family and fresh roots and sweet cream are all the bourgeois asks from the country now to arrive at these every barriere or gate of paris offers on a sunday a confusion of vehicles of every description vehicles undreamed of in the annals of coach-making vehicles that seem never to have been made they are so ugly so heavy so inconvenient no workman ever could have designed or executed these excrescencies of coach-making there is your cuckoo a large cabriolet containing three seats in depth and supposed to hold nine people but on sunday it is discovered that these nine can hold nine more on their knees then en avant marengo shouts the driver to the thin lank harridan who stands whisking the flies away with his miserable shorn tail Arrêtez! shouts the voice of some belated passenger and the driver stops or the twenty drivers of twenty cuckoos all alike stop to catch the last passenger ici mon bourgeois ici rattles from all quarters marchez donc es rune from the groaning and reeking inside with an oath that sounds like a conglomeration of all the r's in every alphabet in the world montez montez from all the drivers in a breath and the bewildered passenger climbs up the nearest vehicle the driver gives him his own seat and coolly seats himself on the knees of his passenger en avant and off they go no not yet what another where is he to go there's plenty of room where where why on the footboard to be sure with your legs stretched out so comfortably on the horse's back the best place in the world you ought to pay double for you have the pleasure of a ride on horseback and in a carriage at the same time this is called riding en lapin though why i cannot tell any more than why the vehicle is called a cuckoo 
for it has no ornithological resemblance to that bird that can be seen well at last off they go in reality all good-tempered all beginning to date their day's pleasures from the accidents and events of this ride whence they emerge into the bois de vincennes the park of sceaux or the plains of clamart very red very hot and very thirsty as the marchand de vin can tell you ten minutes afterwards then for montmorency and versailles such aristocratic places you have the real diligence with its coupe and rotonde and its four horses with rope harness jingling bells and a wag of a conductor with his blue uniform and gold laced cap saying pretty things to the chambermaids as they stand at the door as he passes drinking with the outside passengers and talking so gingerly with the fine ladies inside bound for a picnic in the forest of montmorency a forest composed mostly of cherry trees under which you dine and have the dessert dropping voluntarily from the loaded boughs into the dishes beneath then you have the omnibus which will carry you for six big copper sous and an unheard-of number of bits of pasteboard of all colours mysteriously dealt out by the conductor and called correspondance from the barriere des roules to the barriere du trône there ensconcing yourself in another omnibus under the protection of another piece of pasteboard and the same six sous you will be taken to vincennes or to any place you choose within six miles of paris a good deal of shouting a good deal of laughing some quarrelling a little fighting lots of pretty grisettes quantities of witty workmen in brand new blouses twisting their well-trimmed moustaches some rollicking students a few very quiet and discreet young ladies with papas in blue coats white gloves black trousers and pumps leaning on gold-headed canes and looking indignantly solemn innumerable gamins emerging from everywhere and climbing heaven knows where such are the charms of a jaunt among the petite bourgeoisie of paris very funny very characteristic and uncommonly dusty what are we going in reality on such an expedition as this certainly this is paris here are the people painted by paul de Cook. you will only find them here as you will only find him in the porter's lodge the grisette's work-bag and the workman's pocket englishmen and englishmen alone read him in the higher ranks and fancy they are getting an insight into parisian life one wonders they ever come to paris after such a course of reading the paris there depicted can have so very few attractions but they do venture and many perhaps are sorry to discover that there are other authors in paul de Cook and other ranks of life than those he painted asterisk the publisher of this work would beg to observe that paul de Cook's works are of a different description from the innumerable infamous volumes which have been published in this country under his name and which were composed by persons in new york and boston whose vileness did not hesitate to add fraud to obscenity the real works of paul de Cook, although treating for the most part of the life and manners of the lower classes and written in exceedingly bad taste are still not such as to exclude their author's name from all mention in decent society End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the swimming bath let us again at early dawn say between six and seven o'clock walk across our trillery the gates are just opened the birds are awakened and the flowers send forth fresh perfume it is the month of june the genial morning foretells a warm day now let us go over the pont royal and turning rapidly to the left go down a flight of steps which leads to a very picturesque-looking wooden house and beyond to a large extent of canvas which may be anything now it is no use proceeding any further if you are of the nobler sex there is no open sesame for you nor bribes nor favour this is the lady swimming bath suppose we are a sylph and have whisked through the keyhole or a lady and have paid our money at the gate either one or the other will do and so we will give you a description of these watery mysteries which without us you could never penetrate beyond the barrier which has closed behind us and most inexorably before you is a heavy thickly stuffed oil-cloth covered door which excludes even the sound but if you lean over the balustrade of the bridge 
you will catch many a splashing sound and many a merry laugh will reach your ear as though the seine had suddenly become thronged with nymphs and naiads and the waters as busy as the streets we meantime have entered the sanctum and find ourselves on a wooden gallery enclosing some three or four hundred feet of the seine along these galleries are dressing-rooms furnished with chairs tables mirrors all of graceful forms but made of simple pine wood without any painting or varnishing indeed from out of the whole of this establishment paint is entirely banished as are also carpets for soon all these beautifully clean and dry floors will be wet and dripping from the paddling of innumerable pretty naked feet the water enclosed within this gallery is divided into three compartments the first has a boarded floor allowing the most timid and the least tall to walk about in perfect security the next division is deeper to allow of swimming but not drowning the last is without any false flooring meant for the use of skilful and expert swimmers this last compartment is separated from the rest by a fanciful wooden bridge without any parapet of which more anon now forth from the numerous dressing-rooms before all alluded to come the bathers there is one universal costume black merino or serge pantaloons and a black tunic with a broad belt some of these dresses are embroidered and embellished in various colours those who have pretty arms you may be sure wear short sleeves the feet and ankles are bare all forms and all ages sizes and complexions are here even to young children who by the by are the only gloomy-looking beings in the merry throng on whom cold water appears to have no exhilarating effect children of all nations seem to have an innate natural antipathy to cleanliness and cold water when we said that none of the nobler or sterner sex were admitted within this canvas sanctuary we ought to have made an exception in favour of four amphibious specimens of that sex chosen for their colossal frames and gigantic strength as well as for their skill as swimmers who preside over the whole assembly these four tritons clad in white flannel from head to foot are here to impart the art of swimming now considered a necessary appendage to a lady's education and to rescue from drowning any who with the reckless daring of a woman may have ventured into deep waters and with the helplessness also of a woman require a strong arm to get them back to shore these tritons are not regarded by any prudery by the lady bathers they are the familiar gods of the place and each as she passes has a cordial salutation for the wet brawny and good-natured monster bonjour jean grand garde jean je vais me noyer the children too will climb upon jean or pierre's shoulders out of a spirit of frolic and fun and also to retard the ducking so much dreaded and abhorred if you hear a shriek it is from some unlucky urchin who has been traitorously precipitated from the rock it clung to namely the shoulders of jean into the water or is scolded into it by mamma or elder sister amongst the young girls and the young married women of which the bathers are almost entirely composed more mature ladies rarely venturing here there is the greatest cheerfulness and harmony no ill-natured remarks no rivalling no retorts no haughtiness they vie with each other in dexterity when in the water and send showers of pearly drops at each other here there is a genuine admiration and appreciation of each other's grace and beauty a desire to please a desire to oblige because because must it be said the element of female discord man is absent trois poules vivaient en paix un coq survint and the hens begin to fight says la fontaine so it is with women if ever women could be seen to advantage not physically for we doubt the becomingness of black merino and cold water but morally it would be at this side école de natation pour them the young girls freed from the conventional swaddling clothes which encase young french girls are full of easy grace ready wit and merry laughter the young married women of paris is said to be the paradise laying aside all coquetries and pretensions are as charming to their young companions as they are to their admirers and the tritons look on with broad jocund faces as once old neptune may have gazed at the sporting of the nymphs of thetis the real object of these baths is positively to learn to swim for this a broad belt is fastened round the scholar to which is affixed a rope by which one of our flannel tritons holds her suspended in the water in his other hand he has a long bamboo and with this he indicates the movement of the limbs giving directions all the time in a stentorian voice 
the scholars as soon as they begin to feel confidence are made to swim in the boarded or safe portion of the bath getting gradually into the deeper water where as we have said before imprudent and reckless girls often venture too soon their foolhardiness ending in a convulsive scream for help then one of the tritons rushes to the spot plunges into the water seizes the gasping patient and bears her off in his arms as though she were a baby laying her quietly on the gallery and then leisurely resuming his accustomed place without any visible signs of emotion apparently as unconscious of his wet condition as he is of having saved a human life about nine o'clock the swimming bath is in the height of its glory the children have been sent home and the elegant for whom nine o'clock is early because three or four in the morning is not late have arrived as the long string of carriages on the quay will testify then commence the trials of skill the tricks the merry jokes the bespattering with glittering drops the snowy shoulders and the glossy tresses so beautifully braided here side by side swimming gently down the stream the round ankle and moulded arm just moving the waters are two friends or sisters exchanging in whispered accents the mysteries of their feelings and sensations the only events in the lives of women born to the monotony of prosperity here floating like a personified nautilus stretched at full length on the waters her dark eyes closed is one who is communing with busy memories or deep thoughts which take her far from all around now three or four merry nymphs pass by at full speed with flashing eyes and heaving bosoms the red lips parted and the transparent nostrils dilated with excitement like ardent steeds to win the race whilst on the wooden shore the admiring tritons stand and bet upon the winner the result of these meetings ends generally in two or three impromptu parties to breakfast or luncheon at the restaurateurs of the palais royal a frolic perfectly allowable in paris to ladies and to which prudery nor even respectability that most susceptible and unindulgent of despots has anything to say there is however one condition and one exception to this rule that is no unmarried woman is of the party as soon as the black costume has been laid aside and the costume de ville resumed the mamas and daughters re-enter their carriages the order is given to the coachman to drive to the palais royal but en route he is desired to stop at home and deposit mademoiselle mademoiselle gets out without a murmur and proceeds demurely upstairs where on a little table drawn close to the window by the attentive femme de chambre she finds a delicate breakfast of bread butter eggs fruit and coffee prepared for her this she proceeds to demolish with such an appetite as two hours in cold water may have given her discoursing all the time with said femme de chambre who waits on her of what she shall do and what she shall wear and where she will go quand je serai mariée when i am married can safely be said by a french girl she is sure of being married her marriage is the business of her whole family and her friends as soon as she reaches a marriageable age an old maid is a rara avis at france then it must be said that in france where marriages are made by the father and mother they are not so ambitious or sordid as in other countries the daughters who manage their own matrimonial affairs have proved themselves in modern times to be fathers and mothers are content to think that there is every prospect of their daughters attaining when she shall have arrived at their age the prosperity they enjoy they do not expect that a man at the age at which men marry shall have reached the height of his profession or the honours and riches to which he will ultimately attain daughters in free countries read life as they do a novel the third volume first meantime our swimming mamas have driven to the frere provenceau or to vefour entering from a side street and going up a private staircase they are ushered into an elegant and retired dining-room with its cosy round table temptingly set out here free from all intrusion or from all suspicion of anything unseemly or unorthodox they throw off their mantillas and bonnets and proceed to order breakfast it begins always with vite d'ostende oysters no bigger than a two-shilling piece and green as a mermaid's dresses then these delicate creatures proceed through all the luxuries of the carte ending always with the inevitable cafe au lait and probably between the first and last taking the foam from a bottle of champagne during this time there is a lull at the école de natation the money-takers read the news and dip their bread into a frugal cafe au lait the tritons group together on a wet and wooden bench anything dry would feel uncomfortable absorb great hunches of fromage d'italie head cheese 
fromage de brie or sausage helping the same in its downward course by long draughts of pure red wine water being only used outwardly by these goodly creatures too wise to abuse any of god's good gifts towards one o'clock about the time the theatrical rehearsals end the swimming bath resumes its activity every one is at his post the money-taker puts aside her paper and the tritons hide their bottles and resume their bamboos very different are the ladies who now enter the watery arena instead of the simplest they are in the most elaborate toilettes and many are accompanied by a maid who in her well-fitting dress her jaunty cap and her silk apron with its coquettish pockets is quite as important and ambitious a person as her mistress as they advance into the galleries which however have been swept and dried exclamations of horror little shrieks of affectation and loud complaints of all and of everything resound on all sides jean and pierre are scolded and ordered about in most imperative tones and these worthies without replying obey the various orders in a most cold and dogged manner to the complaints of the wet and the dirt and quel désordre they do not deign to reply but mutter something about the folly of satin boots and trailing silks winking at the dapper maid who replies by a smile and an expressive shrug of the shoulders when these ladies come forth from their dressing-rooms they have it is true all black dresses but they are made in the most fanciful shapes and most elaborately embroidered in all sorts of colours and devices the hair is dressed in curls braids or ringlets as though for a ball most of them have valuable some even diamond earrings and on their bare arms one or more gold bracelets the maids follow with embroidered and perfumed handkerchiefs smelling bottles and fine towels now with many pretty coquettish airs the fair bathers all by the by much handsomer than those of the morning get down into the water their object however is not fun or health or enjoyment it is evidently display the arms and glittering bracelets are thrown about with affected carelessness if by chance one comes unclasped and falls into the water the cool indifference displayed by its owner excites as it was meant to do the admiration of all around the conversation now carried on is far less good-natured and not clothed in such elegant or correct language as in the morning but it is perhaps much wittier and takes on an epigrammatic turn the tritons flirt and joke on the galleries with the ready and forward ladies maids there is little chance of their services being required for most of these bathers are expert swimmers and of undaunted courage to explain the mystery the present company consists of the actresses of the variete the ambigu the opera comique the gymnase the vaudeville in fact of all the subordinate theatres not the leading actresses in point of talent but the leaders of fashion in their own society bohème in point of riches and extravagance some few lorettes of celebrity are mingled in the throng but these are very humble in the presence of the artistes and much looked down on by these exalted ladies since the cold swimming bath has become the fashion in the higher circles and amongst the femmes honnêtes the class who are pariahs from this society but ever eager to imitate it have adopted the cold water bath though the whole affair is entirely contrary to their lazy habits and their luxurious natures they are all just come from rehearsals after this bath which they make no longer than sufficient to make their friends admire and envy their ornaments and die with jealousy at the liberality and extravagance of one another's protectors they get into their carriages drive about the boulevards buying everything they fancy then home to their perfumed louis the fifteenth boudoirs where they taste of some very light repast then comes an hour's sleep after which it is time to go to the theatre supper follows this supper the only meal of these children of luxury and pleasure the grisette who loves pleasure also has distinctive tastes from the actress she loves the country is hungry at all hours and feels sleepy at ten o'clock the actress on the contrary hates the country has very little appetite and only begins to live after midnight these are the ordinary days at the école de natation but towards the end of the season there comes a grand gala day which has a most original aspect and from which be it told en passant the class of bathers we have last described are rigorously excluded about twelve o'clock on this day which takes place at the end of the season numerous visitors all ladies however 
are admitted with tickets into the interior of the swimming bath there they are received by the tritons in elegant white flannel costumes bound with blue worsted and with bouquets in their buttonholes and shewn to seats which have been prepared all along the galleries towards one o'clock the bathers issue from the dressing-rooms and circulate amongst their friends their dark dresses forming a strange contrast with the elegant morning costumes and the pink and white bonnets of the visitors then at a given signal the exercises begin first comes a race from one extremity to the other of the enclosure between the most expert swimmers quite as exciting to the spectators as the race for the derby or the emperor's cup though the prizes are only huge bouquets of lovely fading flowers instead of trophies of silver and gold then come various evolutions diving floating swimming with only one arm with the feet only in fact all the difficulties of this difficult art this is the first part then ices and lemonade are handed round a band engaged for the occasion stationed within hearing but without the enclosure strikes up some merry music and the dripping bathers cause much fun by going round amongst the visitors who dread their approach as one does that of a shaggy newfoundland just emerged from a pond after a pause the signal for the second part is given then on the wooden bridge which we before alluded to appear several ladies one in some picturesque fancy dress comes slowly along absorbed in a book which she holds in her hand two others walking arm in arm are gaily chatting and lastly a stately dame with flowing robes a fan in one hand and a bouquet in the other advances majestically along suddenly the fair student's foot slips the bridge has no parapet and she is precipitated into the water she disappears there is a breathless moment of anxiety when suddenly she rises to the surface laughing her book still in her hand and springs all dripping on the wooden shore scarcely has she reached it before the stately lady her hands and person embarrassed with all kinds of ornament and drapery falls also into the water this time the spectators look on with curiosity but without alarm when almost at the same instant one of the two remaining on the bridge likewise falls off this time it is an accident and there is there must be danger hark a cry for help the young girl on the bridge has heard it and springs to her companion's assistance she is but just in time apparently and yet those men placed there for safety in case of accidents are immovable they stir not move not but look placidly on the visitors rise en masse some scream some turn pale and appear ready to faint when all at once two laughing faces appear above the surface of the water and with an arm on each other's shoulders the two young girls swim to shore much delighted at the sensation they have created and highly flattered by the bravos and applause of the tritons who shake hands with each other exchanging congratulations on the skill of their pupils but the stately dame what has become of her how will she get to shore see there she is she is sweeping majestically along the waters why does she not come now to shore see she dives again what does she seek her fan she has it now and now again she disappears what does she seek now her bouquet here she comes the bouquet in one hand the fan in the other her features unmoved she sails calmly like a stately vessel before the wind now she comes to the wooden steps and mounts them at a majestic pace then with a merry laugh throwing her wet bouquet to jean and her fan to pierre both grinning like jolly sea monsters with satisfaction and delight she runs to her friends and amidst bravos kisses and exclamations surrounded by the whole of the bathers the victors in these river games receive the huge bouquets and wreaths given by the establishment and presented with many awkward attempts at a speech and much real emotion by the head of the tritons then the assembly disperses the visitors going first and soon after out from the dressing-rooms come the bathers themselves joining the remaining groups of relations and friends who are awaiting them not one of these happy young girls leaves the école without a word of kindness and a gift to their good-natured instructors who stand all melancholy in a silent group by the door watching each well-known form as it disappears at length the very last has departed 
there are no more within any of the dressing-rooms the check-taker has closed her little window and the poor tritons follow this last of their pupils out beyond the barrier to the very outward gate they see her spring into her carriage and as it drives off catch the last sparkle of her bright eyes the last wave of her hair and last sound of that gentle voice which says so sweetly au revoir jean au revoir à l'année prochaine au revoir murmurs jean turning back disconsolately into his deserted canvas hall au revoir qui sait ah worthy jean who does know who can tell what a year may bring forth to beings lovely young and susceptible placed within every temptation exposed by their refinement education and sensibility to a thousand ills undreamed of in other and humbler classes the école de natation lasts three months from june to september all a parisian summer will allow of cold water though it is said that diane de poictiers and ninon de l'enclos owed the prolongation of their beauty to the daily use of the cold bath if this be the case it is rather a practice to be discouraged for what would become of the rising generation of beauties if the preceding one retained their charms and powers of fascination to the age of eighty-two end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain versailles versailles is almost paris so we will take the railroad from the rue saint lazare and for two francs we shall in twenty minutes be in the city created by le grand monarque louis the fourteenth it is a lovely route passing through some of the most beautiful portions of the park of st cloud ville d'avray which by the by comes first with its beautiful villas and reaching versailles in one of the best parts of the town before we go sightseeing let us look a little about the town no one ever thinks of doing that and i question whether many people ever think there is anything but a succession of picture galleries and palaces in versailles excepting restaurants which adjoin them and barracks and soldiers which are everywhere now it is not so the palace which called such a numerous court within its walls also founded one of the handsomest and best built towns in france the streets are wide the house is regular and of fine stone in the grand and massive architecture of the day mansart and le nôtre were not monopolized by the king they have displayed for nearly all the noble families of france the taste and talent which raised the finest palace in the world and laid out these far-famed gardens of course the mansions i speak of have changed proprietors they are no longer the abodes of revelry elegance and riches still versailles is very well inhabited and the society assembled there though of course nothing in proportion to the capacities of the town is select and high-toned house rent the most expensive item in paris and the bugbear of small incomes is very low in versailles many of the families of the faubourg st germain who on their return from immigration found their property had become national property and were reduced to mere competency prefer the large and lofty houses of versailles to the little close coquettish apartments the same sum would procure for them in paris widows of officers or distinguished men but poorly pensioned by government men of studious habits literary men of the highest grade all love versailles the retired tradesman is choose it as dull artists actors the arteries of the great city body can take but snatches of it for their life is the capital and they like the light of a lamp so brilliant in the night but so pale in the sun can exist only in the tumult turmoil and excitement of paris but more than its palace where art and its wonders absorb the mind do its solemn silent majestic and grass-grown streets appeal to the remembrance of bygone days and the echoing of your own footsteps through them made so wide to admit the four-horsed equipages and outriders that continually dash through speaks in earnest tone of the vanity of human greatness and human glory the race for whom this town was built the proud nobility of france has passed away its power has gone the names engraved on every page of past history are no longer inscribed side by side with the great deeds of the day another class has arisen 
a class without ancestors or antecedents created from the blood of this very race which flowed for days over the pavement on which we tread the king around whom all clustered for whom mythology and ancient lore was searched to find some name that should express beyond all others the godlike attributes of their idol has had his very ashes cast to the four winds of heaven his descendants are in exile the power of his race has fled from them and even the memory of louis the fourteenth has been dragged from its pedestal the grandeurs of his reign analyzed despoiled of its halo his magnanimity slandered his passions anathematized and he now stands like a stranded vessel which the wreckers have despoiled a mere symbol of royalty as the mouldering hulk is of the once fair ship which breasted the foaming waves perhaps as you enter the palace marie antoinette and her fair-haired children present themselves to your mind rather than the prosperous and gilded court of the founder of this palace but in this gallery of the oeil de boeuf with its mirrors from floor to ceiling its gilded columns and painted ceilings it is the court so teeming with life youth love valour and brilliancy which come before you these splendours want the waving plumes the rustling silks the clanging swords on this polished floor one cannot fancy blood or rifle balls through these gorgeous windows and yet louis philippe the much quizzed old fogey king did more for versailles than the bourbons and its present condition is owing to his arrangements the whole of the restoration was governed entirely by the master intellect of the duchess d'angouleme and she turned with a shudder from versailles she remembered the massacre of the swiss guards her mother's terror and the last flight of the last princess who ever slept under the roof raised as a world-wide memorial of bourbon greatness well people french people have laughed at the somewhat superficial embellishments and restorations of the citizen king they have ridiculed his yards of historical painting but it cannot be denied that though some of the paintings are daubs it is a very pleasant way of studying history to follow this pictorial chronicle of all the events of the french reigns from charlemagne to louis philippe and one can forgive his paternal vanity in having made his sons heroes of battles in africa as grand and bloody-looking as those of fontenoy and waterloo for the care with which he has composed the napoleon gallery whose pictures recall grouped within the brief existence of one man as many noble deeds lasting institutions wonderful achievements and heroic actions as are recorded through whole centuries of three lines of kings till louis philippe's time the pictures of napoleon's reign though painted by gerard gros david and vernet had been sedulously hidden from the public but louis philippe hunted up from the royal garret every memorial art had left to immortalize the immortal deeds and name which have distinguished france for ever amongst all nations here are portraits of bonaparte at all periods of his existence from mere daubs of the thin bilious sub-lieutenant done by some artist friend to try his skill to the emperor in ermine robes placing the imperial crown on his brow at the altar of notre dame here are portraits of josephine when first he saw her the great and admired lady he trembled to address here she is weeping by his side when first the word divorce so long echoing in her heart assumed a sound and substance there she lies with hortense and eugene weeping by her corpse further on is marie louise a fair fat unmeaning german face which does not even give indication of force enough for the vice and degradation to which she fell the king of rome too he is everywhere in every palace in every room of the palace where he was likely to pass the fond father placed the image of his son and yet they tried to erase the father's name from the memory of the child but the heart knew it and broke over the remembrance this is pauline the beautiful pauline canova had but to copy the form for these statues of loveliness and grace and the face was worthy of the form all napoleon's sisters are here all his generals most of his enemies the duke of wellington who owes his fame to the importance of his adversary rather than to his own achievements is here alexander the judas who betrayed with an embrace is here talleyrand with his wrinkled face and pale blue eye Fouché, all are here and eagerly we go from one to another for there is something about the wonderful career of napoleon which appeals to our imagination 
like a ghost story to which one listens with beating heart and kindling eye in the sculpture gallery is one statue you must see you know i am not a cicerone of sights but of sentiment it is the lingering spirit of the good angel of the bourbon family within these walls and shows the immortality of art above all other glories there it stands beautiful in itself a statue of the virgin heroine joan of arc sprung from the genius of the young princess marie of orleans the second daughter of louis philippe who designed moulded and chiselled with her own hand this statue so marvellously vigorous expressive and yet feminine now for the gardens for you have before seen the chapel so still so magnificent so calm yet so aristocratic that one feels it was made for kings to pray in and do not care to follow the crowd to see louis the fourteenth's bedroom as it was when he lived restored in all its velvet and gold hangings and feathered canopies by louis philippe come into the gardens park as they call it here is the fountain of neptune which costs such herculean labour and such immense drawing of the public treasury there is very little water now but when it plays fountains issue from all these tritons and fishes and even the horses of the god himself spout forth their streams in all directions a pretty sight but every time the waters of versailles play it costs the city twenty thousand francs poor louis little he cared for these wonders he created for at last his only enjoyment was to creep to one of the ponds and feed fishes who knew him or the bread he threw and wriggle their tails at his approach stand on the terrace of the palace to the left is the orangerie the trees are all out and about the grounds the perfumes are wafted before us bordered on each side by thick shrubberies and flower beds is a large extent of green sward leading by a declivity to the pièce d'eau des suisses a lake made by royal command beyond are the woods of sartory a lovely view a magnificent sight unequalled in the world where art has created all nature denied and fashion to picturesque civilization the beautiful productions of nature not only was the garden laid out and embellished with wondrous care and taste but for miles and miles as far as royal eyes could see was the landscape fashioned into pictures no hut unless picturesque was left no tree unless cut to shape left standing admire nay you cannot but admire you may talk of the uselessness the tyranny the injustice of such a palace for one man but admire you must years hence too when you are far away and your thoughts recur to this palace and this scene you will acknowledge that you have seen the greatest monument of the taste genius and power of man the greatest effort of art and its splendours that success of generations ever bequeathed to the world End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain life's first ceremony and its last it would appear that different as are the habits and customs of parisians their manners and their modes of living scarcely could there be any difference in the few first days of a baby's existence in france and in other countries yet in none of the various stages of existence does france differ more than in its earliest hours in the first place the wailing epitome of mortality destined perhaps to hold a very large place in the world in which he now takes so small a corner is generally introduced into this life by a female physician be it known that these lady disciples of lucina about which there has been so much wondering and discussion in the united states since women have aspired to the study and practice of the arduous science have existed for many years in paris here they are regularly educated in the schools follow a regular course of lectures both theoretical and practical and at length obtain regular diplomas this peculiarly feminine branch of the medical science is however the only one practised by women they do not give consultations or attempt to dabble in any other branches of the healing art all men being thus almost universally banished from the sick-room the baby is washed with wine then with water after which he is enveloped in a succession of broad bands called swaddling clothes and then placed in an elaborately bedecked cradle 
and left literally to chew the cud of his own sweet and bitter fancies for beyond a spoonful of chamomile tea and two or three of warm water and sugar your new-born gentleman gets nothing during the first twenty-four hours of his existence within these first few hours however he is wrapped up almost to suffocation and carried by papa and the nurse to the mairie here to be registered as a french citizen and as a son of his papa and mamma without which formality he would in after-life be nobody's child at all at the end of this time his country nurse has come with her own baby to fetch this addition to her family if the child is to be taken into the country the best thing that can happen to it by the by or alone her own child being put out to nurse if the nurse is to be that most spoiled and petted of despots nourrice à demeure a resident wet nurse the fortunate peasant woman selected for her health and beauty from the environs of paris receives as much as eighty francs a month eighteen dollars for her services every caprice of her appetite is satisfied for fear of souring the font on which the baby fattens every ill-temper humoured for fear of souring the baby's temper a sub-lieutenant assists this commander of the nursery sparing her all the hard work and getting many hard words in return in fact between the despotic nurse the yelling baby and the timorous inexperienced mamma papa is made to feel particularly uncomfortable at home and begins sometimes to feel as though he ought to apologize for being there at all meantime the mamma is not treated at all like a sick person air and light are not excluded though flowers and perfumes are most rigorously so by the bevy of female cerberuses at the door of the sanctum namely the mother of the accouché the monthly nurse the doctress and the wet nurse on the third day mamma is dressed that is as much as is seen of her in a beautiful soft conglomeration of lace and embroidery combined with blue ribbons if she has presented a son to her liege lord and pink if it is a daughter the room is set in order the drapery of the window and bed are put in graceful folds and an elegant counterpane generally of muslin lined with silk is displayed on it baby all black yellow and blue lies grunting and sleeping in his beautiful cradle wadded and batted carved frilled and laced himself the ugliest thing about it and his nurse in her high norman cap with gold earrings looking like play-hoops for her charge and clean white apron sits majestically beside him about twelve o'clock all these preparations being completed the newly made grandmamma dressed in a toilette bespeaking the circumstances at once suited to do honour to her visitors and not misplaced in her daughter's room takes up her station in the drawing-room adjoining now during the three days it has taken for the women-folk to come to this stage of the proceedings papa has been having printed and distributed to all his acquaintances notes to the following purport madame blank est heureusement accouchée d'un garçon blank or d'une fille la mère et l'enfant se portent bien monsieur blank a l'honneur de vous en faire part madame blank has been happily brought to bed of a son or a daughter both mother and infant are doing well monsieur blank has the honour of informing you of the event this billet is equivalent to an invitation for all the lady's acquaintances to come and call on her and accordingly from the third day preparations are made to receive them very soon the bell in the ante-room begins to tingle gently and sisters aunts cousins friends and acquaintances in full morning toilette drop in after the hugging and kissing and congratulating and a full relation of the most ordinary of everyday occurrences always considered and talked of by women as wonderful and unheard of events the visitors are ushered into the bedecked and expectant mamma and b no unmarried ladies not even a sister can be admitted to these gossip visits a few days later comes the first grand ceremony of the aspirant to life the one which is to make him a christian it is pretty hard for the sleepy struggling baby who hates to be roused from his torpid state or bothered in any way except for his oft-repeated meals but there is another person for whom this ceremony is the very height of tribulation botheration and bewilderment besides being no trifling expense and this is the person chosen for the high dignity of godfather usually this much to be pitied personage is the grandfather of the infant or the most intimate friend of the newly made father he has the privilege of giving his name to the child and of choosing his own godmother having done this to his satisfaction 
he proceeds to send to said godmother one dozen white kid gloves three or four dozens of boxes containing sugar plums called dregis de baptême which said godmother is bound to distribute among her friends a present of jewelry or something else for herself a present for her the godmother to give to the mother of the child a present for the said godmother to give to the nurse ditto for said godmother to give to the godchild to the mother of the child he himself sends one dozen gloves three dozen boxes of sugar plums the mother must give to her friends on returning her visite de couche some present of value or a costly knick-knack to the child a silver cup or a silver knife spoon and fork with the privilege of repeating the offering in some form every year as long as they both shall live to the nurse a present in money ditto to all the servants in the house including the concierge besides all these taxes on his purse the godfather pays all the church dues and finds all the carriages and feeds all the beggars who at a christening a wedding or a funeral are inevitably to be found at the church doors such are the attributes of the godfather and strange to say they are accepted cheerfully and executed with great good temper but good temper is one of the great distinguishing characteristics of the french nation the godmother's attributes are a mere sinecure consisting of a pretty new bonnet a smiling face and if an unmarried lady an intense feeling of love for the little squalling godchild if a wife and a mother a magnificent display of a thorough knowledge of the whole matter young ladies excluded from taking an active part in almost every ceremony of life are allowed to be godmothers a christening being a religious ceremony and often the godmother is chosen by the gentleman with ulterior views to another religious ceremony more interesting to both the papa as we see plays a very subordinate part in all this at the christening however he is bound to provide for the christening party on their return from church a déjeuner of which they partake with much delight and jollification sending in to the originator of the feast the mamma some delicate dish or some choice fruit sufficient to scare all the matrons and monthly nurses in great britain or the united states and make them prophesy all kinds of calamities and catastrophes to the patient a patient however the mamma steadily refuses to be for before the baby is a fortnight old we find her attending high mass and then proceeding with demure step and self-important air to take her station in the tuileries followed by the no less important nurse bearing the indifferent torpid baby amongst the little colony of the rising generation we have already described and so we leave this sprig of mortality to wend his way from petted and spoiled infancy into the rude scenes of the world where unless he is a rare exception he will have to repay with usury all the enjoyments and endearments of his childhood we have seen now a french wedding and a christening we have seen how the graves are tended and how the loved ones gone before are remembered let us now see how in france they bury their dead with a strange inconsistency the french with whom family ties are so sacred for whom the graves of the departed are so hallowed have a strange horror of death scarcely have the physicians declared that medical science can do no more and that even hope is extinct before the priests are sent for and love affection and sorrow retire from the deathbed leaving all that remains of mortality in the bosom of the church the extreme unction once administered all earthly ties are dissolved kneeling far from the bed where in silent agony the work of dissolution is slowly going on the wife children and friends are absorbed in prayer they have said the last word that is to be said on earth they have looked their last look henceforth the loved face will be seen but in the tablet of their memories it is a priest who will receive the last sigh it is a priest who will close those eyes which with one last wild look gaze around before becoming forever sightless after the ceremonies of the church not only do the relations and friends leave the room but they actually leave the house of the dying or dead by rude strange hands are the last offices performed no gentle hand with vain but touching tenderness is there to wrap the beloved form in fair white draperies or place with holy care the pale cold head now for the first time cold and insensible to caresses and affection upon the pillow where it is to rest for ever watched by a priest covered with a sheet four candles burning at the four corners of the bed the corpse lies alone untended 
and uncared for during the few hours that intervene in france between death and burial by order of the police it is required that a body should not remain above ground over four-and-twenty hours on the morning of burial rude hands the undertaker's underlings bring a rude coffin of common deal unlined without any ornament or paint and whistling joking and smoking they enclose what once was endowed with feeling intellect and life in its narrow bed then the coffin is carried down the street beneath the large porte cochere or gateway a temporary chapel is constructed consisting of black velvet and silver hangings and tall silver candlesticks with lighted wax candles on high trestles the rude coffin is placed and quickly hidden by a velvet pall having deep silver fringes and silver spots made in the shape of tears as if they had any on one side of this coffin stands a priest with a brush in his hand which he dips continually into a vessel containing holy water and then sprinkles it on the coffin all the passers-by throw holy water on the coffin and some kneel down beside it and murmur a prayer for the repose of the departed men as they pass the dead lift their hats and women make the sign of the cross after some hours of this exhibition the hearse followed by as many carriages as are necessary takes the corpse still covered with its pall to the parish church which is inside and outside hung with black and over the principal door of which there is the name of the deceased his titles age and qualities now when we say that the church is hung with black we mean to say that its magnificence is in proportion to the money expended in the funeral pomp the burial of the dead is in the hands of the company called entreprise des pompes funèbres and each class of funeral is by them taxed at a certain immutable price the lowest being one hundred francs excepting however the funerals of the poor a mere hurrying of the coffin in a sort of hand-barrow painted in rusty black how high the funeral expenses may reach we are not prepared to say but to judge from the little obtained for one hundred francs and the extreme magnificence of velvet and silver in which sometimes the whole architecture of a church is hidden the beauty of the singing the quantity of the choristers and incense and the zeal of the many splendidly robed priests to say nothing of the long string of carriages the mass of feathers on the horses the number of hired mourners and the size of the silver tears we should imagine that some funerals reached as high as ten or fifteen thousand francs on leaving the church the procession takes the way to the cemetery where at last the body is deposited in the grave still however it is of this world the earth has not yet hidden the coffin from all eyes and the grave diggers pause before commencing their work around the open grave are gathered the intimate friends of the deceased and he who was nearest to him now standing at the head of the sepulchre in the midst of most profound silence pronounces a eulogium on the corpse at his feet relates his deeds of glory his good actions his virtues his intellectual endowments then after an earnest farewell he takes a handful of earth throws it on the coffin and retires the principal mourners each then throw their handful of dust to dust and now friends have looked their last enemies have done their worst love and devotion can do no more the grave diggers do their office and forever he who was is gone from all and so the dream of life begun in a down cradle with lace and silk curtains to shield the tender eyes from the very light of heaven hope love and tenderness to watch and guard the frail and fragile spark of life is ended in the dreary and dismal churchyard with the cold earth pressed on the once loved form and the pale moon with god's bright stars to keep the nightly vigil whilst all who have wept are trying gently to forget what once was joy and life and hope but now is nothing. End of chapter 18